to see you. It's uh, great to be on the podcast. You were a, you were McDonald's All American and highly recruited. How did you end up picking Virginia? Yeah, it was a awesome experience. Um, uh, to be honest with you, um, my high school experience playing in, in New Jersey, in the Jersey Shore area, Monmouth County at, at Christian Brothers Academy, we had a great tradition. And, um, you know, I owe a lot to, to the school and the, and the program there. And we wound up being able to play at a, at a national level. And that helped gain me a lot of attention. Um, and I think also playing at Five Star Basketball Camp was a big reason why I was so highly touted. And my, my recruiting experience was awesome. Um, my, my final five schools were uh, North Carolina, Notre Dame, Villanova, Stanford, and, and the University of Virginia. And, and, you know, honestly, they're all such great, great schools. Um, my father went to the University of North Carolina, so I had a, a bit of a tie in there, but um, I really enjoyed Villanova as well with Raleigh Massimino at the time, and then I'm Irish Catholic. So you know, people, people were looking at me cross-eyed when I didn't select Notre Dame, you know, when I went out there. Um, but um, it was really the combination of a, of a couple of things. It was um, being able to go to a, a high-level institution from an academic standpoint that was always important to my family, my parents. Um, um, so all those schools kind of fit that. But the idea of being able to play fairly soon, too, um, basically from my sophomore year on, um, there was a real opportunity to step in a, in a role where I could, you know, run the team. And then just my, my vibe there of just the social um, aspect of the place. Um, you know, I really was looking for that true student athlete experience and, and Virginia, you know, was the perfect fit along with the coaching staff. Terry Holland to me was someone that, um, you know, drew me in. I, I really thought he was the, the quintessential Southern gentleman. He, um, you know, had a, a, a nice way of connecting in terms of being um, someone you could really trust, someone who was sincere and, and yet very competitive and, and wanted to push our team to be the best we could be. During your freshman year, while the team was, while the season was going on, did you feel like you made the right choice? Did you have any regrets? Did you have any thoughts like, oh, maybe I should have gone to Notre Dame, maybe I should have gone to Nova? <laughs> no, you've done, you've done your homework there. Yeah, that freshman year was tough. Um, you know, we go wind up going like 13 and 18. I still remember it's the worst season I had in my entire life. Um, and you know, we are look our our seniors on the team. You know, really just didn't get didn't provide great leadership. Um, it was a really challenging year. Um, there was a, a lot of mix ups. I think that the the thing that actually saved me, Mark, was um, towards the end of the year, just due to some issues with personnel on the team, I wound up stepping in as a starter. Um, and it really helped set the tone for me and gave me the confidence that, um, you know, I could, I could carry and run a team um, at the ACC level um, and, um, you know, help really sustain the momentum for me going into the summer for my second year, which is where, you know, I really came kind of into, it got more comfortable and came into my own. So, you know, I, I think that's all part of it. I mean, look, sports is about ups and downs, man. And um, and I certainly, you know, had more downs in that in that first year. Actually, if we could take it there for a minute. I remember, so I, I was 10 years old, you know, as a kid, huge UVA fan. And I, you know, one of my first memories was actually John Johnny Johnson one day just up and disappears. Um, I, I, I want to say it was like middle of the season, maybe after, you know, maybe on the road at some point. Maybe talk about that. What was that like for you? Because it was like you get thrusted into that um, right away, you know, after hearing, hearing, you know, that he's out for the year. What was what was that whole – was that yeah. like a whirlwind or – It was. It's a great way to put it, uh, TW. I mean, a whirlwind is exactly what it was. Um, you know, I had, had some early success playing and really, you know, backing up uh, John John early in, in the season and playing alongside with him, maybe pushing him to the two or floating off to the two spot. Um, but, you know, when when the, the kind of the rug got pulled out with, with him and, and, you know, some other situations from a personnel standpoint on the team, and it was like, you know, you got to grow up quickly. And, um, you know, we did the best we could. And, we, you know, we were lacking some talent at that point, too, in a very, very competitive league, as you guys know. So, um, you know, I, I was always confident in my, in my skill set, but, you know, you still as a, as a young player and, and it was different then where right. you kind of had to work your way in 
as a freshman. It wasn't like right. now where guys are coming and going one and done and, and right. you know, you're just thrust right in. It, there was much more of an emphasis on senior leadership then. So right. I had to grow up quick. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny Johnson was a badass. Like he, I remember like vaguely, but thinking, oh my God, if he's out, we're done for. Like there's, you know, we weren't having a great season and if he's gone, yeah. I just remember thinking, I was telling Doug, I was so young at that age, I was like, well, aren't they just going to cancel the season if he's not going <laughs> to, like, that's how, that's how dumb I was. I'm like, well, why are they playing college basketball anymore? Johnny Johnson's not there. Um, yeah. But, but was, what was that like in practice? Like, was he really, was he really pushing you hard or? Um, yeah. I mean, we, you know, look, it was a situation where, you know, everywhere I've always gone and we've always tried to play hard. I mean, you know, Doug can speak to that. You know, I used to, uh, you know, go at Doug Hart and um, in, in terms of any point guard, it was always, you know, a personal challenge to try to push that person, have that person push back. I think that's what makes um, team better competition does. And it was that way um, with, with John John. And, and again, I came in highly heralded, you know, as a, as a McDonald's All-American. And that was, um, you know, there's certain things that come with that, that, uh, you know, where, where guys on the team want to, want to come at you too. So, um, I think that was very much uh, part of it in the early part of the year, yeah. And was was there some camaraderie with your McDonald's All American class? Because we, you know, we were just looking through it, like Larry Johnson, Ozzy Corciani, a bunch of superstars in there. Was it was was that a thing back then, like it is today, or was it more competitive? You know, I, yeah, no, it's a great question. I still, I actually have uh, here in my office. I have a the plaque they gave us, which is like uh, of twenty five guys, and it's always interesting for me to look at it and see you know who who were you know who made it to the nba and who lasted the longest and who made the most money larry johnson but uh you know it's just kind of interesting and there is a camaraderie because you're you're thrust together as you know young 17 18 year old uh guys and you're you're um and basically i played in two different mcdonald's games the one in dc and then the, the national one which was um in philadelphia at the time and, you know, you're spending a week with these guys doing different, you're practicing and then you're doing different like charitable activities and things. So you really get to know play, the guys' personalities and, you know, develop friendships. And um, so it is funny looking back and, you know, court, typically the, the point guards would, would be together and, you know, Corciani's who's, who's a guy from Miami where I live now, which is kind of ironic. And, um, I got to know him well. King Rice, who wound up going and playing at Carolina when Corciani was at NC State. Um, Sean With Rodney, Rodney Monroe, right? He was. That's on that right, team. Rodney Monroe yeah. too. Fire and ice, right? Fire and ice. Yeah. Those guys are... <laughs> but um, you know, it was, it was an incredible uh, guard play. Um, you know, with that group, a guy named Elliot Perry, who uh, wound up you know playing at Memphis and then in the league for a long time. Um, Elliot's awesome. What a great guy, Elliot Perry. Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix Suns, right? Was it? That was right. what I remember him. That's right. Cool. That's one of the teams he so it was it was a uh, good camaraderie, and then you know guys that seem to always you'd see him down the road in your travels. That's awesome. Yeah. And if if we're gonna jump into the UVA season, we were just all chatting about this before. We got to talk about the NCAA tournament run that you had all all tournament. What do you remember about that in terms of, you know, obviously the Oklahoma was the big one, but uh, the couple leading up to that, what, what, were, what was your mindset at? What was going through your head? If, if you, or do you even remember it for that, for that matter? Oh, no, I remember it. It was, it was great memory. That, that 89 team was so much fun because um, we, we had a couple guys come in uh, from a junior college perspective who really provided great um, athleticism on our team. Brent Dabbs is the one I'm thinking of as well as Curtis Williams and, you know, we really needed that at that point in our front court. And we had Richard Morgan, who was who to this day is one of the streakiest players I ever played with um, in, in any level. I mean, Rich, when he was on, was as good a shooter uh, as I've ever seen. Um, really that good. But when he was off, he could be incredibly off too. And right. you know, we right. saw that. And, um, and didn't care. No, but he was, you know, he had to be good for us to be successful and, and we rode him a lot during that that year and he got uh, hot and our team really played at, uh, at a hot, high level too so um you know i i would tell you um i thought i you know between getting brian stiff as part of our team he developed late in the year and we we really played well as a group sharing the basketball um 
making shots, pushing tempo more than we did during the course of the regular season. And you could just see our confidence rise. I mean, actually, Coach Holland saw it early and said, guys, I think, you know, we got a chance to do something special. He thought we would make the Final Four. And, and obviously, we fell a little bit short, but we did some damage along the way. That win against Oklahoma was really special, um, beating the team who was number one in the region, um, a team with Stacey King and um, Mookie Blaylock. I see, I see uh, Stacey King now. He does the, what I do for the Chicago Bulls. He's the, he's the uh, you know, color uh, analyst for the team. And he's still, every time we talk, he goes, man, I still can't believe you guys beat us that year, <laughs> which I love. Um, so that's, that's fun. After they put it on us the year before, my first year, um, that Oklahoma team with those two guys uh, and Billy Tubbs as the coach really, really put it on us. So it was, it was a great run. Right. A um, lot of fun but that year. Where was that game the year before your freshman year, first year? We were playing in um, in um, Christmas tournament in Hawaii. Um, right. and, and, I mean, they beat us. I can't even remember. It was the largest score I've ever lost by my life. They, you know, they pressed full court, um, and, and we really didn't execute well at all, and it was, it was a humiliating loss. I didn't know that story. So then can you share with us what you're, you played for Holland for a couple of years and then you get Jeff Jones? That's correct. Yeah. So Terry Holland, um, along with Dave Odom, really uh, were the primary recruiters and, and, and the guys that, that uh, I really connected with. Um, and, you know, my first three years, Coach Holland um, was the head coach and Jeff Jones, who'd been a graduate assistant and gradually been working his way up, up the chain, um, at UVA, um, you know, f basically got the job as a as a, a really the youngest coach, in, I believe, in the history of the ACC. If yeah. he's 32 years old or something, I know, he's, he was 28 years old when he got the job. To Wasn't turning that 20. young? Yeah, I mean, it was he's just it was it was a weird turn of events, guys. To be honest, and um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the inner workings since I was, um, you know, a player at the time, but. You know, there was a situation basically where Rick Barnes and Mike Montgomery were the two finalists for the job. And Rick Barnes, is my understanding, initially committed to the, to the job. And Rick was the coach at, at, at Providence University. And um, I heard that the, the Big East Commissioner, Dave Gavitt, called him and said, you can't take this job and leave the Big East. And he literally um, reneged on the deal hmm. after, you know, Mike Montgomery from Stanford bowed out. Um, all, all the candidates were, were bowing out and then all of a sudden he reneges on the deal. And I think it, it was fortunate because JJ was the, you know, the recipient who was able to come in and get the job. Um, and, and JJ was ready. I mean, he was, he's a guy who, you know, he was someone I pointed to, um, to our administration and said, you know, he can get it done. He had the respect of the players. Um, he knew UVA in and out having, you know, played there during the Samson era. And um, he was a guy who had great competitiveness and, and really, um, you know, I thought had maturity beyond his years to take, take that over. But not an easy task, by the way, with some stubborn, hard-headed fourth-year right. players uh, on that team, you know, trying to come in and, and, and coach us. <laughs> that, that's something I always remember because, like, your year, Dirk, yourself, Kenny Turner, Matt Blunden, you know, I, I came there 18 years old out of Fayetteville, Tennessee. I know you were worried about your position. When you actually met in Nashville. I, told, I asked Coach Holland, what, what if I outplay Crotty? Do I get to start? And he was like, yeah, good luck. So Crotty put me, <laughs> Crotty put me in, his back, in his back pocket for two years, to be honest with you. But I learned a lot. But you guys were real, like, leaders. Like, I, I thought you guys were, like, 30 years old. We'd go to lunch, and you were 21, and you might have a beer with your lunch or whatever. And I was like, but you guys were really, like, real, true leaders. And I wonder if it still exists at that level today. Uh, look, I don't know. I mean, look, we took great pride in, in, um, in being the best we could be. I know, you know, that's always been the way I, I've tried to, um, you know, be as a point guard, I always feel like you're the leader on the floor, right? And, um, you know, I would never ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do and, and try to lead, you know, lead by doing by example, but also very, very much vocally, um, you know, trying to make sure things are going the right way and, you know, yep. give yourself the best opportunity to win and work hard. There's no excuse to not work hard. And look, you know, we, 
we practiced every practice. We, we competed in every game. There's, you know, you just yep. don't have time to take, to take days off. We, we didn't believe in load management back then. <laughs> no, you, you, I think, I think after one tobacco road trip, you were, um, you were hooked up to IVs or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, I was like, uh, I was like Co that. Coach Allen, if you play me more than two minutes, he might be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you you taught me something i think this is in insight these guys one thing you said to me when i was coming in i asked you about playing oklahoma and mookie blaylock and you gave me an answer i would never think as a as an athlete or basketball player you said after three trips up and down you could learn a point guards kind of game if that makes sense and you said you could bait mookie he was a big time uh steel you know lead uh, steel leader at that time right Right. And you can kind of bait guys or get there like Corciani. You said just back off, back off, back off, back off. He's going to pass. He's going to pass. Right. But how did you – is that – are you just bizarrely intelligent? Is that some feel that you have? Or I always thought that was yeah. interesting. I think, look, part of that was studying, studying players and mentally making notes and, and really trying to learn tendencies. And, um, you know, I, I, I was a real student of the game that way. I know, if, um, you know, to me – people, you know, sort of look as a, as a, as a smaller white point guard, people always think you're not athletic enough to be able to compete with, you know, faster, more athletic black guys. And, and the way you do it a lot from, from a point guard perspective, in my opinion, is you change speeds. And that's yep. something that I was always really, um, you know, smart at. And it, it really was because my dad coached me to do that. And, um, you know, it, it really works. I mean, you can keep the fastest, quickest, most athletic guys off balance by changing speeds. If you're playing at the same speed the whole time, I don't care, um, right. you know, who's guarding you, whatever, they're going to be able to catch up. Even if you're the fastest guy, they can beat you to spots. But if you're changing speed, hesitating, you know, crossing over, changing direction, but kind of constantly keeping them off balance, even the even the quickest defender like a Mookie Blaylock can't gauge and when to reach in and make those types of plays. And I think that's a very underrated, um, you know, skill to have in terms of changing pace. A lot of younger players don't really learn it. Maybe they do it by accident, but they don't understand how how valuable that is. And I felt that was something that you know that I tried to do against those guys. And then defensively, I I've, I've always believed in position defense defense where. You know, I'm always going to stay. If you ever watched me play, I would always be between the 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 my man and the basket, and particularly if they're handling the ball. I, I I wasn't a big reaching guy. I had very long arms, so I could tend to play off guys and, and move laterally, keep them in front, and then with the longer arms compete on the ball that way. So I think that that helped me kind of negate some of that athleticism that other guys might have had, and and try to read them, Doug. To your point. Yeah, interesting. When you talk about studying guys did you study through through uh, uh reports through scouting reports did you study through film at the time it's interesting because i'll have conversations with, with ty and i had them during the season when he played at uva and we talk about like the night before a game what, i would say hey what's up bud? what are you doing say oh, i'm watching video of the player i'm about to play against yeah. film wasn't as accessible then as it is now right so what was your method of studying guys no, it's it's a it's a very good point. I mean, the the level of sophistication now of the scouting is insane, um, and I do I see that because I see what the Heat players, um, you know, the tangible report that they get that they study. I've I've seen and it's amazing. I mean, they can they'll actually have services that provide, you know, um, you know, Ty Jerome's going to go right, you know, fifty seven percent of the time, you know, and left, the, you know, the other. He, he wants to shoot jumpers from this area you know, X amount of times. And, sure. you know, we didn't have that type of sophistication and Doug knows, but I, I would say I did watch film. I also was just a student of watching games. Like I would watch the guy play other games and try to really lock in, um, you know, what they did well, what was their strength? What was their weakness? How could I try to take advantage? Um, and then, you know, really during the course of the game, have to make adjustments too. Um, you know, I think that's the other thing. You can't just go in with a mindset of I'm only going to do this. Um, you have to look and see the way the defense is responding. Um, and that was always a challenge for me because the defense is a lot of times maybe, you know, schemed toward taking away something that I did well and I would have to counteract that. And that was part of the strategy and the, um, you know, sort of the fun, the challenge for me of, of how to make our team better and how to, how to ultimately win. Yep. I want to take it back to your fourth year as a student athlete. 
and you got Jeff Jones, who's a who's five or six years older than you are, maybe seven at the time. And you were a leader, and I'm sure you were fairly intense, and you have to be to be a really good player. And you got to be somewhat strong-headed. When you clashed or when you disagreed with Jeff Jones, did you, did you approach that differently than you may have a Terry Holland as a third year? Um, so, you know, look, I, my, my, I was raised always to be respectful. And I think I always was always respectful to, to all my coaches at every level. And, you know, with Terry Holland, um, he was, he was much more of a father, you know, figure type guy to your point with Jeff being right. you know, more of a older brother, you know, type of age, but, um, you know, with, with coach Holland, I think he understood how ridiculously competitive I was to the point where he would actually give me space, um, and be much more tactful in, in talking to me when, uh, maybe not in the heat of the moment where I, I wouldn't have responded as well. Um, whereas Jeff, similar to, to my mindset had, you, you know, would, would run hot and, um, you know, maybe be a little bit more aggressive in terms of the way he would try to get a message across, which, you know, probably didn't always work as well with me to be perfectly honest. Um, and, uh, I think that's the challenge of, of coaching too, is like finding how to convey, uh, the message you want to the player because everybody's different from a personality standpoint. Um, so yeah, it was, it was harder for me with Jeff, um, to be, to be fair. Um, you know, but look, I, I, I think, um, you know, part of that was also, he was stepping into a team and Doug knows this, that, you know, I think we were, we were ranked seventh or eighth in the country before the season started, just because of, you know, the senior, the senior group, the core group having been together for a long period of time. And we had, you know, we had a, a really good season. Um, but things started coming apart later in that year. We had a, we had a um, a series of games, and Doug, I don't know if you'll if you remember this, but this to me, I, I still cannot believe that the ACC had this in our schedule. And from this point on, we literally yeah. went down. And I don't know if you remember this stretch, Doug, but we played. I still remember it because it's maybe the worst stretch in the history of my career. We played Duke on a Thursday night at Duke at like nine o'clock at night. Yep. Um, we lose in a competitive game. I remember I had to get an IV after the game. We play Saturday morning at like noon in Carolina, at Carolina. Yep. yep. We, get, we get our doors blown off. And then we play at Wake Forest with Dave Odom coaching that team and lose in a squeaker on Sunday. So we drop yep. three games in Tobacco Road like that. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden – you know, we go from being a team that was a, sort of a favorite in the conference to, you know, trying to trying to gain our footing again. It, it was it was an amazing stretch, and we didn't you know we didn't go deep on our team, right? So to play three games in four days as college young college players regular season, I mean, I've never even right. heard. Well, JJ always there's actually an article about that where Jeff Jones thought that was his rookie coach welcome to the ACC that they would <laughs> schedule him on Tobacco Road back to back to back, no. and as you said. And back then, I tell these guys all the time, you know, there, there were four to seven NBA players in the court every game. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like there's no breaks in the ACC. It's a smaller conference, et cetera. So and highly, Wake, highly competitive. Stuff. Wake had Rodney Rogers at, at that time. They That's were, right. They were, yeah. yeah they were and they had, you know, they, Childress was on that team as well. Yeah. There were, you know, and, and Dave Odom was a – look, Dave Odom, you know, he was a great coach. I mean, look yeah. what he accomplished at Wake Forest. And then he gets Tim Duncan, right? And he goes to the final right. four. I mean, he yeah. was a hell of a coach that, you know, uh, you know, Cook Holland was actually trying to replace, was trying to, you know, send it to Dave. And the AD at the time would not allow um, that transition. And that's why right. Dave left and ultimately went to Wake Forest. Right. And they, people forget our, our Wake because of Dave Odom. Wake, Virginia games back then were just brutal <laughs> battles. Sure. Uh, I mean, they, they, what did Dave Odom not know about our team? What do we not know about his team? And Well, the thing that he basketball. always said, too, and, and we would talk about is he'd always go, they're just tougher than you. You know, UVA is just going to wear you down. They're tougher than you. And that's what the challenge he would, he would give to his guys so that the game would yeah. always have this, you know, element of, of you know, physicality and, and, and grit, and it would go down mm -hmm. the wire more often than not um, because he would constantly be preaching that. Um, and challenging his guys, um, which made it which made it harder, obviously. Yep, those were great. Do you guys. have any idea why 
why Dave was not considered for the position? I think there was, uh, you know, look, there's, at the time, Jim Copeland was the AD, um, and, you know, rest in peace, he's, he's passed on, but um, he and Coach Holland had a, had a real, um, there was a real clash of wills there. You know, Coach Holland, I um, had, had felt like, I, you know, look, again, I'm, I'm speaking my opinion. I, I, I think you'd have to, you know, go to the, to the, to the man himself, but, you know, at this point, um, basketball had really been, um, you know, providing great income and, and, and been a huge part of what the school uh, tradition and, and experience had been. And, and Jim Copeland, who was a former football player, was starting to push money and funds over to the football program uh, right. when Coach Holland wanted a new arena, et cetera. So there was a huge, you know, philosophical difference in, in what was going on from a, a fund standpoint of where they were being allocated. And so I think that's one of the reasons why Coach Holland left um, and wound up becoming the um, athletic director at Davidson. But um, so he, he really didn't want to listen to what Coach Holland offered in regards to, you know, having a similar, maybe hard headed guy like, like him coming in that he was going to have to deal with as opposed to doing more of a national search. Right. So there's so many questions I want to ask you that I'm, that I, I'm looking forward to this. I can't think of one more than asking you about Dougie Fresh. <laughs> what, uh, what did you think when you got to campus? I remember thinking, you know, who's this, who's this, you know, Southern white dude, you know, coming in, bopping around. Um, he was, um, you know, he was, he had this, you know, sort of unsophistication to him, but at the same time, everyone, <laughs> Everyone loved him. Like he, he, he connected with everybody right away on multiple levels. And, you know, ever, everyone just loved him, you know, and he was a hardworking guy who, who wanted to get better. And he, he, you know, was a guy who, um, sorry, a guy who, um, you know, put the work in every day. Um, but, you know, look, I, I can't say I'm, I'm sure Doug, you know, didn't care for me a whole lot. I wasn't always the kindest, you know, gentlest person with Doug, um, you know, throughout the, the couple of years that we were practicing against each other in particular. Can you yeah, give when, me an example when, of that? When you, when you kicked me out of our dorm room at, uh, at GW that time, it didn't bother me at all. I could I spent the weekend with Havlicek somewhere. That was fine. I always remember, you know, you... you <laughs> You guys forget because you're older, but the younger guys remember the stories of you guys. And I remember after the, we used to work in DC together and I was with room with Crot, learned a lot, et cetera, maybe. And we we're driving to Charlottesville afterwards where I was going to spend the summer. Yeah. And I'm with Crotty with his uh, little white, whatever that car was with the blue Jersey license plate. Solid to there. go to Corolla there, man. I put some miles we, on that bad boy. We, we come over, probably Guns and Roses blasting and we come over the hill and it's the, it's the second time I've been to Charlottesville. He goes, he goes, Dougie Fresh, welcome to your home for the next four years. And it was just kind of a cool thing. It made me, made me think, damn, because back then, four years, that might as well be 100, right? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't, have, I didn't have a great visit because you guys were getting ready for, um, I guess, Michigan. That's um, right. It was rainy, so I didn't get any of the, you know, shenanigans that I had at Arkansas State and other more illustrious universities. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bro, that was a pretty tough time to, co to come take a visit. It was a pretty intense uh, atmosphere then. Um, yeah, I think I think Matt Blunden took me to some whack movie. I forgot what it was, and I was like, "All right, this is this place is awesome." <laughs> I'd, I'd rather be I'd rather be drinking wine coolers at Arkansas State right now, to be honest. With you. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, I mean, so Crow was just a tough guy, and he. I, it took me twenty five years, and I told him at the Final Four this year. I mean, I, we all play with a lot of good players. But, you know, I was my level. He was his level. And he was the one guy I could never deal with. You know, I practiced against Corey Alexander every day. Corey's Corey. And I could get Corey at times, but not all the time. But I could never mess with Crotty. And Kenny Turner looked at me. And that conversation, he goes, Fresh, you don't get it. Crot does that to everybody. Like, if you're a walk-on, if you're the backup, if you're, you know, McDonald's All-American, he's going to make it a point to win the three-mile race in boots. To like, you know, didn't take a day off to his point, which I learned a lot from. Yeah. Well, I, look, I, I appreciate you saying that. I was, 
incredibly, incredibly ultra competitive. And uh, you, you, you bring a smile to my face when you make me remember those three mile runs with the boots on. That was just so ridiculous. I mean, what, what <laughs> complete idiot I was back then. But I, I mean, it was, it was also like a point just to kind of stick it to the coaches who are making us do all this that I figured, you know, all right, if you're going to make us do this, I'm just going to stick it right in your eye and, and run in combat boots and try to win anyway. <laughs> But, you know, ultimately, I think I wound up putting so many more wear and tear on my on my knees uh, by my fourth year. I was yeah, you know, a lot of miles. <laughs> uh, but but so I will give Crowdy credit for one thing. My first year, I had a I had a lot of girls that like wanted to go on dates and hang out or whatever. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm you know I must be the smooth guy from Tennessee that, as he mentioned before. <laughs> and usually usually about halfway through whatever the date was was or hanging out or going to Bonnie Castle or whatever we did. They'd always bring up John Crotty. Hey, do you, do you know where John Crotty lives by any chance? You want to go see him? I'm like, I'm like, he's got a girlfriend. Leave me the, what are you doing? <laughs> so it kind of worked, kind of didn't. <laughs> got to use whatever you got to use, Doug. You know that. Use whatever you use. I love that about you. <laughs> at, least they weren't asking, at, least, at least they weren't asking me to meet Terry Kirby. That <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, uh, too good. So I was going to say one last question on that, on that, that exact time frame with the machine game. Um, and Dougie, you watching it and you playing it. I remember that game as being yep. just like devastating in terms of like similar to how you described your, the, the Maui Invitational game where it's like everything just went right from it. I mean, Glenn Rice, I don't think he, he's, that was ridiculous. Ramil, I mean, that was just like the perfect storm. Um, what, what was that like for you, John, in terms of, this is your chance to final knocking on the door of final four. And then that happens. Like it was the halftime speech. What's cause I remember it was like right out of the gate. It was like 30 to six. I think it was some point or something crazy. What was the halftime speech? What was the, 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 the mood for that game? DW, I appreciate you ruining my entire morning. By <laughs> you so much. No, I mean, that, that game was just the proverbial steamroller. Um, and as, as hot as Rich Morgan you know, could be for us. And, and, you know, we rode him the majority of that year in terms of his production and had some huge games with Carolina as an example, where he had like eight threes and he was so cold and, you know, he could not make a shot. And uh, when you look at that Michigan roster guys, by the way, and I became friends and played with against and with, with some of those guys later in my career, I'm friendly now with, uh, Glenn Rice, who actually works for the Miami Heat. That was an incredibly talented group with Glenn Rice, obviously uh, knocking down three ball after three ball. You know, Ramil Robinson was a top draft pick. I was matched up on him. Uh, I believe they had Lloyd Vaught as well, who was a, you know, a, a, a former teammate of mine for the, with the Detroit Pistons. Sean Higgins was on that team. Yeah, Sean Higgins. Um, I think Terry Mills might have been on that team too, and he didn't even do much in that game. I mean, this was an incredibly loaded Michigan roster um, that just absolutely got it going and, and um, with their shooting and, and, and got hot. Um, and uh, so, look, I, you know, I wish I could tell you we, we could do something to, to change that up, but they got it going to a point where we just – we didn't have enough talent um, – you know, to stop them. And, they, and they're and if rich, if rich wasn't shooting at a, you know, at a ridiculously high level, we depended on that and we would run our offense a lot off him too. So that, that made things very difficult for us. And you got, you got, you're also, you were, you were scoring at a very high rate during that tournament, as opposed to yeah. say a Tony team to con contrast a little bit with now. Yeah. I mean, look, I was scoring, Bryant was scoring. I mean, look, the first game we won in that tournament, I mean, when I think back, it's pretty amazing. I still remember yeah. the score because it was so high. I think, I think we beat Providence 197, which yeah. is really a high score for a, for a college game and particularly, you know, in an NCAA setting and, um, you know, in, in, a, in a situation, um, you know, really where you don't know a team, you know, you're playing still that fast. So, we were scoring a lot of points. We were really getting up and down, but Michigan had great depth. They had great physicality and size and athleticism. And again, then again, with, with Glenn Rice, I mean, look, Glenn Rice is, was an NBA all-star and one of the, you know, top three point shooters, um, you know, in the league for a long time. And, and we, we got to experience that firsthand. And then, and then fast forward to 
you know, 2019 when Virginia, you know, Minneapolis was, did the, how was that arc for you, your, your story in terms of like being a part of it, seeing it, I, I, I know you said you weren't there for the finals, but being a part of that environment, what was that like for, for you? It was awesome. Uh, I was so pleased that my wife and I actually both went out. It was, it was honestly, my schedule so incredibly busy during the year due to my, you know, Miami Heat um, television um, broadcasting career. But what was so amazing and that the stars aligned and God was looking out because we played the Minnesota Timberwolves on, on uh, Friday night. Oh, that's and amazing. I was already in Minnesota, you know, I mean, it's just Minneapolis. It was incredible. And then to be able to go to the game the next day and, um, you know, see Doug and the guys, uh, we were, we were all holed up at, you know, some, some, uh, dirt ball bar where we were hanging out for three or four hours <laughs> catching up with everybody. The loon, the loon cafe, direct, uh, direct train <laughs> into the stadium. But what a, what a, what a, um, what an awesome time, um, to see everybody, um, and get to see, uh, you know, Mark, your son and, and those guys, what a special group of, of guys and, uh, under the leadership of, um, Coach Tony, who I think is, you know, to me, arguably the best coach in, in America right now with what he's doing year in and year out. Um, so it, it was a real special run, and uh, I couldn't have been prouder of the team. So, Willie, I, think, I, think, we, we had, I was going to say, we had Willie Durst. We had a few guys come on talk about when, when Tony Bennett came on, he gave him a call. What was your first interaction with, with Coach TP? That's my question, too. So uh, uh, my first interactions with him in the NBA, guarding him in the NBA, you know, as a um, not 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 a whole lot of left white hand white uh, <laughs> left hand white guards in, in the NBA, you know. So and there's, and there you have to. <laughs> <laughs> so we're matching up on each other, and we're you know the scouting reports like you know get up on his left hand. So I was I was laughing about that, but he was a very good shooter. And, um, you know, I remember him playing for the Charlotte Hornets. I was actually with the Jazz at the time. And I remember him knocking down John Stockton as good as he, as good as he was. And, you know, he's maybe the greatest point guard in the history of the game. Used to regularly help down off of guards going for steals. He's the all-time steal leader. I don't know if you guys knew that, but yeah, this leader. Amazing. But he would help off from the top. And Tony – was getting like open shots and banging them down. I think I came in to replace Stockton and Tony had made like three threes. And, and um, that was my first you know, recollection of connecting, but he's That's been an true. amazing um, guy. We've had, a, we've really developed a nice relationship where I go see him every time I come up to Charlottesville, watch the team practice. When they come down here to Miami to play the Canes, I'll come to shoot around and we've developed a nice rapport. And I, I got, I got so much respect for him. And, um, you know, so, so glad he's, he's the coach um, of our team. That's looking awesome. back, <clears throat> again, looking back as a fourth year and, and as a graduate UVA, did you have favorite places to play? Did you have places where you went into games where you were like, oh, gosh, I really don't want to play here? <laughs> I, I, look, I love the ACC. I mean, I just – I feel like – I still do. I'm biased. I think the ACC is the best conference – you know, in, in the country. Um, and back then, and I, and I, I kind of, I feel bad for the players today because one of the things that was special about playing back then was that you played away and you played home against yeah, every right. single team. Yeah. I mean, there was a real rivalry, you know, and, and you really over, you know, your four years, you would, you would catch the vibe and really know what you had in store for you when you went um, to that opposing right. arena, you know, there was a real, sense of, of rivalry and um so to your point you know i loved playing at duke i mean i i people a lot of people didn't it was it was very intimidating i think when you're a young player um you know i never was able to win there um that was really maybe during their arguably their best stretch uh you know of teams they've ever had but you know i had a few big games i know i had a 30 plus point game one time where i really got it going and you know, just coming into that arena and they're just booing you every time you touch it. And, you know, the devil's got the blue devil guys got, you know, like karate as snotty as a uh, headband. <laughs> on. I'm like, really? I'm like, you know, really? You know, exactly. like, How do you beat that? Right. If, if you're a college basketball fan, that is the bucket place. That's got to be on your bucket list. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's, there's, I can't imagine anywhere else watching a game that you have to do. You have it's, to I mean, make that trip. 
It's great. And, you know, it's, it's nerds or us in the, in the, in the audience all bonding <laughs> together, you know, coming up with stupid chants and everything, you know, so it's, uh, it's fun to come in there and try to beat them. And yeah. look, going to Carolina was special for me because I grew up going to basketball camp there and my, you know, my dad played there. Um, you know, I'm trying to think in, in the ACC, I, um, I remember going to Clemson regularly and while that, that they were never a powerhouse, it was, it was like, you know, rednecks are us down there. You know, you'd be standing yeah. on the sideline trying to throw the ball in and they'd be pulling your pants down and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> You the know, students yeah. sat, they sat right under the basket, remember? That's right. That little they were right next to you, literally, when you're out of bounds, and they'd be, you know, doing yeah. whatever you could to get yeah. your head. So that's Jamal, that's Jamal uh, Robinson felt, was on a couple of weeks ago. Jamal, we had Jamal Robinson. He talked about a story. Yeah. We, he was at Clemson with some fan called him the N-word. So, I mean, you talk about rednecks. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, not, I'm not surprised, but, you know. I, I, was, I was right at home at Little John, I'll be honest with you. From we'll kind of see. <laughs> you're like that was home for you you're like oh every, every word in the book these people get me <laughs> can, can we are we okay to jump into this little photo series i know we're short on time here um yep let's do it so so you know we, we generally just show some images and just want to get your reaction um what you remember about them um uh, here, here's the first one 9091 look at that that's amazing Voted uh, most likely to succeed poster for the people listening and not watching. I always wonder who came up with these cheesy themes, man. But that was, uh, <laughs> I, I always, I laughed at that one because I remember seeing it afterward. It looked like I was, I was the guy in the picture. Look at the frame, like wrapped around. <laughs> <Yeah, that's right. laughs> look, look how young, um, look how sorry young. About, sorry young. about that, Mr. Jefferson. John, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, look like that, you know? Um, but look how young Jeff Jones is there too, right? I mean, yeah. he literally looks like he could be wearing a uniform. It's just amazing. It's great seeing Matt and Bryant and, and Anthony. And uh, I'm trying to remember where the heck we shot that. It was like some local bank or something. That's funny. And it, just, uh, you know, the, the, this next one just shows you what happened after you left um, and where these, these programs went. Let's <laughs> talk about these outfits. Uh, that, that's vintage Dougie Fresh right there, man. <laughs> the muscles better and try to, you know, show his show his pecs off and uh, you know you're, you're missing the gold this. chain, Dougie. You got where your gold chain it must be tucked in underneath the sweater there, pal. It's, it's probably two or three of them. Real gold, by the way. Look at Hav look at Havlicek and Kirby and Bryant Bryant wearing a really bad shirt there. I don't know what's going on with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> we so we we had BJ on. And he's like, I'm pretty sure that shirt is still in the closet upstairs. I'm, like, I'm gonna go upstairs and look for it. <laughs> That's too funny. And look at Anthony. Anthony. Anthony clearly didn't get the the, the memo that you're not. You don't need to wear a suit. So. A I mean, triple. A, uh, is, that a, a, is that a quadruple breasted suit? Ale is that on? <laughs> <laughs> I think it wraps around and buttons in the back. Oh my god, that's great. I mean, he definitely. Yeah owned you guys in terms of outfit he just was like all right i'm coming in sh i'm coming in hot with this um, in front, with that guy in the front and then uh, you know we already we we've talked about a little bit of mda stuff but talk about this these guys here in the in in, in this photo in terms of like yeah carl oh. malone i mean i tried to get stockton in the into one photo with you we, we couldn't find one but talk about that what was that what was that like for you being you know on the on those iconic teams yeah that, those were uh, amazing times um you know i have so much respect for both stockton and malone malone was i think he really changed the position um his physicality and strength inside as a as a, a guy in the post but also became an excellent outside shooter um in, in the pick and pop game where he could knock shots down i love playing with him and running pick and roll with him and posting up and it's funny seeing Sean Bradley there. That's just sort of uh, interesting because I remember our senior, my, my fourth year, my yeah. senior year, um, the ten you know, blocks. We got matched up playing in the NCAA tournament in Utah yeah. against BYU. And, you know, I think he blocked, you know, 14 shots and poor Ted Jeffries, you know, every time he turned around, Sean was blocking one of his shots with his elbow, you know, so it was uh, – it was a rough uh, stretch going against Sean. He was so long. Um, 
but I have great memories and, and Utah was, you know, one of my favorite places to play. And then still on that, on the NBA tip, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, we heard your Jordan story. We, we listened to that on, on Twitter, which is, which was awesome. Another legend from Virginia, Alan Iverson. What was that like guarding him? You know, you, we were talking about your craftiness and you were able to negate a lot of speed. What was it like? Guard, what was your game plan against AI? So I, I used to stay in front of him and do a pretty good job. He had an amazing ability, and, and you'll just look how lean he is there. I mean, people don't realize, I mean, he might have been a, maybe 175 pounds soaking wet, and he would literally be able to get in the lane and slither and finish and take yep. contact. No one, you know, back then people would really try to hit you when you came through the lane using like forearms and stand you up and, and make contact and punish you you know, throughout the course of the game. And you could never really hit Iverson because he would turn in his body and draw contact, but, you know, be able to, um, you know, be effective and get himself to the free throw line. I used to try to stay between him and the basket, did a pretty good job there. He was a more of a volume shooter and scorer to me. Um, so I always felt like, look, if he could, if he had to take 22 shots to, you know, to score 20 points, um, you know, I was doing my job against him and, and just trying to wear him down over the course of the game when when I came in, um, but he was he was a hell of a player. Loved his competitive fire. And what what was like the what was the reaction from the Jazz? What were your strategy in terms of like I imagine when John Stockton is going up against him? Did he have a different game plan for, no, for I mean, a guy like really, him? No, I mean really it was similar um, to be honest, uh, T.W. Because you know we wanted to make him a shooter. He was good going to the basket and finishing and drawing uh, fouls and getting to the line. Um, but, you know, he was a very streaky outside shooter. I mean, he wasn't a guy that was like a drop dead shooter. So if you could make him shoot with a hand in his face, keep him outside the paint, you know, that's what we tried to do. And then, you know, we would try to funnel him, if anything, to our shot blocker if he did get the step. So he'd be running into, you know, more of a you know, Mark Eaton type guy or an Oster tag who was seven feet with length um, trying to finish over top. So, you know, this, this, you guys were this, these two were, I mean, you were one of my heroes growing up and, and then watching Iverson from Virginia also, who were some of the people that you followed in terms of like when last dance is on now, we heard you talk about it. Like was Jordan a guy that you, you sort of looked at uh, that type of way or was it someone else? No, not really. I mean, like Jordan was so beyond, you know, what, what I ever thought I could become. Um, you know, honestly, my goal really as a young player was just to try to play in college in the ACC. You know, that was my goal. Um, I never thought about playing in the NBA. Um, and, and it really didn't become much of a, even a reality to me until um, really like my summer before my, my fourth year. And I was like, you know, I think I got a shot at it. And, um, and uh, you know, I tried to you know, make a difference. And I, I enjoy players who are smaller, who are guards, who could make a difference and impact the game, you know, despite being smaller. I mean, I'll tell you, the era right now with what I'm seeing is amazing how smaller players, due to their ability to stretch the floor with their shooting, um, right. how that's really changing the game. And, um, you know, what a, what a love to have played during this era with the rules where they couldn't hand check you and grab you because it was, uh, it was always so hard to be able to I don't think people realize like how hard it was for a guy like Allen Iverson or Michael Jordan to get open a lot. You'll see my right hand is kind of on his hip on that picture. Um, right. One of my favorite stories I tell people about that era was my rookie year, Derek Harper, who you guys may remember, who's a very mm -hmm. good NBA player. Um, I remember beating him with a right to left crossover and he reached out, put his left or put his right hand on my, on my hip and I literally was like, it was like the Flintstones where I was like running in place and couldn't <laughs> turn a corner and get around them, you know? The guy was so freaking strong. And that's yep. what they would let you do. They'd let you, you know, hand, hand check and, and hold. And, and that would have been a foul, you know, in today's game where you could get to the line and really, you know, you utilize your, your speed. And one last one where um, I, know, I know we're running short on time here. Um, yeah. Keep going. Do what you got to do. It's all good. We're having fun here. Thank you. Oh, we appreciate that. We This is like a rare opportunity for us to have you. So th thoughts on this moment. This is the when the, the rally, the alt-right guys came with torches on, on the lawn. Like where, 
where were you? What were your thoughts? Because I think fresh I was saying, I think you had a kid. Your one of your daughters was was going into college. Yeah, so, this was really it's a sad chapter in in um and you know what what took place and in Charlottesville and what I hate is having this the city and the university you know being tainted any way by by this demonstration because you know that's not what you know UVA is about um I had a, I had two daughters go to UVA, UVA my um see my younger one um was just about to start um this was like the week before we took the kids up for school so it was uh Wow. It was really upsetting. It was really upsetting. And how did how how did your daughters? Did they have any, you know, did they have any anxiety? Like this could be an ongoing thing, or were they like Charles was the best? It'll be fine. No, they. I mean, they had anxiety, and the the, the vibe at the school was really different, Doug, than when you and I were there. You know, after yeah. this, it was a much more of a, um, you know, a, you know, a discussion and. It was right. much more racial tension and um you know that was the beauty i think when you and i were there to me like you know the guys on my team were um that were african-american were, were brothers and you know we we just you know i mean we got along well with the football team we had such a, it was such a great feeling of unity um mm -hmm. you know throughout the grounds um you know i i never felt the racial tension but then again you know i don't know that was my that was my perception right sitting in the right. islands of where I'm at. So, um, yeah, know, so the same, same way for me when you, when you play, when you play athletics at a place like Virginia, some of the other stuff that may or may not exist, I don't know if it did or didn't, but you don't really think about it or realize it, you know, and talking yeah. to that point, I, one thing I always respected about you, Crot, and I'm not trying to just give me, tell you guys how much I love John Crotty, but you, you were a real student. You were a real athlete. You were very, you were a real social guy. And you had this, you said you had this ability whatever you were doing, whether it's throwing the best party at, at university, <laughs> studying or practicing basketball, you were a hundred percent in. It's a real skill set. And I think you I think you bring that to your life to this day with wearing so many hats. You know what? I it's I appreciate you bringing that up. I have such great memories at UVA because I really I wasn't just playing basketball. I was in a fraternity. I was part of a, a semi secret society. Um, I got involved with um, different student groups, um, you know, and that made my experience uh, incredibly rich, you know, I mean, it was, it was awesome from a standpoint of, I, I, I was involved with a lot of different people. I still have friendships um, that are outside of basketball that, you know, that are still very real from UVA. And um, yep. I, I try to do that now to your point with, you know, I, I'm, I'm a television broadcaster for the heat, but I also sell commercial real estate. I'm involved with, with different groups and have, you know, different friends um, in a lot of different things. And to me, it just makes life a lot more fun, a lot more interesting. I also, I don't think you get enough credit for inventing the dance called the lawnmower, which is your go-to <laughs> move. <laughs> Mark and TW, I'll show you that one afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's probably a bad one there, dude. I don't know if I want to take credit for that. That's just... Uh, <laughs> that's I was not. hoping John could stand up and show us now. Yeah. That's right? Not gonna happen. <laughs> per perfect segue into partying. Um, and uh, you, uh, this is the we're looking at the image of the last uh, U-Haul, the last day of U-Haul, right before they did the implosion. Yeah. Um, what, what, what were your thoughts in terms of you know U-Haul going down and sort of the changing of the guard to JPJ? Like, was yeah. that was that a thing for you? Like, was that a was that a a moment that you took took time to think about or it was no it really was and i wish i could have been there and had the experience with um you know seeing all these guys because there's some some faces there obviously i recognize and have a have a good uh history with but um no i my wife and i were both um talking about that quite a bit when it went on and it it, it makes you stop it makes you reflect right i mean that was a place that uh, when I think of how many hours I spent in that in that facility, just working right. on craft, you know, with with guys that that um, you know I, I liked, some I didn't. Obviously, having to work through that too, um, the memories, the highs, the lows. It's it's uh, it's tough to see you know that building get knocked down. Um, but I I will tell you the memories live on, and I think um, UVA does so many good things in terms of like the new building to me, um, you know, JPJ is just so well done. Um, everyone I talk to that goes there is just like, man, what a first class facility. And, 
Yeah. So I, I'm sure they'll continue to continue to do that going forward. Did uh, did Coach Jason Williford um, send you that bullshit brick that he claims was part of U-Haul? <laughs> Yeah, from his rock pile outside his house. You're talking about so yeah. so, so 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 Jeff Jeff Jones does a does a, we've been doing an annual get together. Crop missed it last year. I missed it the year before. And last year we're there, and Jason's oh fresh fresh. You want you want a piece of U-Haul? I'm like yeah, absolutely. I'm only 15 cores lights into the evening. He comes out and he's passing us out bricks, <laughs> and we're you know we're four hours into the party, and I'm like I'm like Jason, there is no chance this is from U-Haul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Come on, Fresh. You know I brought it from you, Hall, Fresh. It's real, man. Yeah, there's no down. chance. I left it over there. Yeah, right. He has a pallet in the back of his car of bricks that he drove down to Norfolk. <laughs> He's like, his car is facing up on the way back, on the way up. Down. <laughs> do you watch college basketball? A lot of it? You know what? I do, but not as much as I'd like just because I'm so NBA driven during the season, right? I mean, I'm covering all, you know, almost all 82 games with yeah. preseason watching a lot of NBA games. Um, but I do watch, um, you know, certain games and certain matchups. I want to see some of the younger talent. Um, I think the toughest thing today, which, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't want to sound like the crusty older guy, but, I, you know, I love when teams, when players stay on the same team for, you know, three, four years because you really can see them grow and develop and you, and you get to right. understand their identity. Whereas now with all these one and done guys, I mean, it's like, you can't really – I'll watch the guy play two or three times during the year and just can't really get a, a flavor for what he can do and, and how it's going to translate to the next level. Right. And can you imagine the level of competition if some of these guys stay two, three, four years? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it would be awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, and again, that's sort of what I remember from a standpoint of, um, you know, really following college basketball. I mean, I think – I think fans really appreciated teams because you can see players develop and, 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 and have true chemistry. Like, and look, UVA to me is like that. I mean, you're seeing guys stay typically at least three years, if not all four, and you're seeing that team grow and that player grow. And it, I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's a pure form um, right. of the game of it, but more often than not, you also can relate to the player better and you see uh, the, them grow and develop and you, and you root for them as a result. Right. And now, can I, do a, can I do a quick fresh story before we get off of this? So, yeah, little known we, fact, John Crotty's highlight as a as a commentator came probably six or seven years ago. I came to a game, <laughs> Marky. I know where uh, you're going. Arena. Crot, Crot gave me and my customer two tickets behind the basket, and we're sitting there, and they do the large cam, like the kiss cam or fine. Jumbotron, cam. baby. Jumbotron. And I know Crot's over there, and I'm here, and I'm sitting there at a timeout, and I'm texting or something, and it's, it's fine pit bull in the stands. And my customer, he, he nudges me, he says, look up. I look up, and they have me as a pit bull lookalike. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't give a shit about, I don't give a shit about that part. I immediately look over to Crot to see if he's watching. He's fixated. And I get a text. <laughs> Thanks for coming to the game, pit bull. So I don't have any <laughs> good. But I did win at Duke. I did win in Cameron, right? Just so you know. Mr. 305, Mr. 305, Dougie Fresh, always allowed down here, man. Mr. Pitbull. <laughs> so, so there's two major issues around, surrounding college basketball right now. There's the players who are maybe not choosing not to go to college, to jump into the G League. And we, we're not going to ask you about that one right now because we're short on time. But we are, I do want to ask you about what just happened last night with the NCAA approving their stance on college athletes become, getting paid now for endorsements. It's, what is your opinion? Yeah, it's, it's – um, boy, it's like – it's surreal to me having, um, you know, gone through the experience the complete other way, right? I mean, look, I was blessed from having a family that was able to, you know, afford to come to games. And, you know, if I needed a few extra bucks um, – you know, would always be able to give it to me. But, um, you know, now on the flip side, it, it's interesting to see that, you know, the, what, what is it, the nil, the name, um, you like know, identity and likeness, um, you know, situation where guys are going to be able to, you know, tap into having followers and, and, and getting, um, you know, money and generating income. It's, you know, I, I think you have to evolve um, and adapt. And, and I, I do think this is a way that, you um, you know, players can 
um, can make extra money, which I think is, is healthy as long as they're, you know, I think there always has to be checks and balances where it's not being abused. But um, I think social media is, is awesome in a lot of ways, but I also hope it, do, it just doesn't turn into guys, you know, turning into, you know, some sort of brand, you know, as an 18 year old constantly posting out things like, hey, I love, you know, Coca-Cola so they can make a thousand dollars per hit. Um, but you know, that's, that's the way it's going. I don't, I don't think you can really stop it. I do think you have to, you can't do it state by state. Obviously it's gotta be something that that's right. fair where everyone can, can participate in. One of my big questions is about that is what does it do to the chemistry of a team two years ago, or was it two yeah. years ago, three years, two years ago when Bagley and, and the other big kid who went to uh, Duke Carter, yeah, Carter. Right. And, and after that season, Carter's family was a little bit perturbed. And the, my understanding is because he didn't receive the same payout that Bagley got or the same recognition that Bagley got. Right. I was going to, I was going to actually wait for Dougie to comment on that. Right? Yeah. He maybe, maybe, maybe he had the 2019 Escalade and not the 2020. So it got a little tricky. Right? And we don't know where that came from. Right? But when you, when you have two guys who maybe are, are looking to get more dollars, what does that do to the chemistry of a team? Yeah. Oh, I, I think I totally agree. It, this has got to be a nightmare for head coaches and athletic directors too, because to your point, it, it just becomes that much harder to, to something else to police something else to, um, you know, have to, have to worry about with, with young, uh, you know, guys who are very competitive. Look, I mean, I'll tell you from a um, NBA standpoint, um, you know, that the Miami heat and, and every team has, they have people that basically monitor um, you know, the player's social media accounts and have right. to see what's going on um, and make sure things are being done appropriate. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, again, during my era and I retired in um, 03, there was always the sports media um, person who would be your liaison with the media where you would go through them and statements would be released and there'd be sort of a cooling off period, if you will, or, or some sort of um, potential review or censorship um, of what you're going to say. And now with Twitter and Instagram and, and the rest, there's no filter. This is direct okay. from the player, you know, out to everybody. And um, again, I think, I think when guys don't think about exactly what it is they're doing um, at times and just blah and throw everything out, it can be, it can be a really bad situation, but from a fan perspective, how can you not love it? Right. You're getting, you're getting, the word right from the guy's mouth right away. Yep. Yep. I have a, I think we're going to close to ending it here, but I have a two part question. The second part is going to put you on the spot. Um, question one, your favorite place in the early nineties to hang out in Charlottesville away from basketball, away from your dorm or your apartment, just to go hang out. Um, Restaurant bar, whatever. Yeah. I think it was actually, there were a couple of places that I would go that are so off the radar and they're not even um, because I've been there now, they're not even around anymore. But one was we would go to this place called the Blue Ridge Brewery. Well, a lot of them were a lot of these places were, if you remember, you and I would be off on Mondays a lot yep. um, because of this the schedule. So I would go out on a Sunday night, you know, when most people really weren't right They were studying for getting ready for class and we would have the day off from practice. So uh, Sunday nights at Blue Ridge Brewery and I remember Down Boy Down would be playing um, more often than not, which was Boyd Tinsley, who later became part of the Dave Matthews band. Um, we knew the bartender there and uh, that was always yep. an interesting experience where he would be doing rum 151 shots and breathing fireballs down the bar. And, you know, that was uh, always <laughs> entertaining. Um, you know, or you had a and that was off the grid because that was a downtown mall where people didn't hang uh, out back then. Right? Well, not quite in the mall. It was like halfway, you know, but still, right. that but was, we never, uh, never, never land back then. Yeah. Yep. You know, always, always good to learn the skill of how to combine fire and alcohol, you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> important lessons. So, um, <laughs> um, I like the Biltmore a lot. We used to hang out there a lot. Yeah. It was more, um, you know, on, on grounds. And then there was this weird place called La Baraca which I would hang out in too, which was over by that foods of, um, of all nations over in that area. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that. One of Derek Katana, who was a, a friend who was an all American wrestler used to bartend there. So we, uh, we did some damage over there too. Did you ever have to pay for a drink in Charlottesville? 
Yeah, I, I had to pay for a few drinks. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it was uh, also uh, good when you put the 20 down and you get the five, the 10 and five <laughs> singles back too. That was always, always a good deal. Uh, I, uh, another, another <laughs> modified press story, the, you bring up, bring up the Biltmore. My fourth year, like I'm, you know, you're gone, come into my own, like I think I'm the man, me and Havlicek and Big Red. There you go. And it's springtime and me and TJ are there, all of us. And at the end of the night, some girl comes over with this black folder and she hands it to me. I'm like, another autograph. Come on, like, leave me alone. I open, it, I open it up and it's like nachos, three pitchers of beer and whatever. She's like, no, Doug, this is your bill. I was like, my bill? <laughs> I've never paid for a beer ever. <laughs> Maybe Crotty and Turner were always paying, paying the bills. But, so that was a, an epiphany for me at that point. <laughs> All Look right, so now, now, now we're going to put you on the spot. Um, it's your own criteria. It can be for any reasons that are your own talent, um, tenure, guys you like. You're Mount Rushmore, University of Virginia basketball. And we give you five, even though there's four up there. As a history buff, you'll know that. It's got to start with Ralph. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Um, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm a history, I'm a history guy. So I got to put, um, it's, it's how old do you go, right? I mean, God, you could put the, you could put uh, the guy who holds like all the records, Buzzy Wilkinson on there back in the day. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, let me think. I'll set him off to the side. You got Barry Parkhill. I put him in there. Um, let's see, Ralph. Um, it's tough. Uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, what, maybe Wally Walker from winning the ACC um, championship to our, 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 our modern day guys. I mean, look, you probably, you, know, you could put, uh, you know, Kyle and Ty and, um, and Hunter on there too. I mean, look. Bundle, you know, we can bundle those guys. We, we let that go. We can bundle them as one. <laughs> bundle them as one. I like that. They're their own, they're their own Matt Rushmore, those guys. Yeah, uh, for sure. And then I would I would put Brian in there from our era. You know, I think Brian has just had an amazing career as the ACC Rookie of the Year. Was all ACC. Was a winner um, all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Brian Stiff. Good list. I like the history part of it. <laughs> usually, if usually if a guest takes too long, my Doug Doug Smith '93 gets plastered up on oh, my <laughs> <laughs> like you, hold up, 1993. <laughs> I knew, I knew you were too smart for that, so I couldn't, I couldn't sneak you. Sure. Well, guys, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. We thank you so awesome. much. You know, yeah, your time was short, you. so we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank That's you so much. It was a pleasure. Absolutely, guys. All right. All right, All right JC. take care. I'll talk to you, you listeners. You may be aware of the 2K tournament we're running to support UVA furloughed workers. Please log on to Twitch to check out your favorite player, compete, and talk trash. And please don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and like each podcast. Also, subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify. For T-Dubs and Cali, for Dougie Fresh across the Hudson, I'm Mark Jerome, and we're giving you locker room access.